Amen, 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 amen. How we thank the Lord for another glorious opportunity to come into his house and to worship his name. If you, if you feel like I feel this morning, why don't you stand up this morning and ask yourself a quick question. What did you come to do this morning? Did you just come to look pretty? Or did you come to worship the name of our Lord and our Savior this morning? If the Lord's been good to you this morning, you should go ahead and give the Lord a hand a clap of praise. You should say something about the goodness of the Lord. The choir sing a song and say, say something, say something, say something. If the Lord's been good to you, say something. If the Lord's done anything for you, say something. If the Lord pick you up, say something. If the Lord turn you around, say something. And it's saved for, say something today. Amen. Amen. I was just telling Miss uh, Brother Applin that listen, that Sunday I couldn't, I couldn't make it to the church, to the church house. I was begging somebody to just please let me just get to God's house. The chaplain came in and I went to the, that that next Sunday. I went in and and she said it don't start till ten o'clock. I said I know. I got to get my praise on right now because this may be my last time. I don't know, since it may be your last time, why don't you get your praise on today? Like this your last time. Amen. Our scripture reading shall be found in Psalm 122. It says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Our feet shall stand within thy gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built as a city that is compact together. Whether the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, unto the testimony of Israel. To give thanks unto the name of the Lord. For there are set thrones of judgment, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love thee. Peace be within thy walls and prosperity within thy palaces. For my brethren and companions sake, I will now say peace will be within thee. Because of the house of the Lord, our God, I will seek thy good. Please remain standing and join us, join in with us as we celebrate our Lord. Come on, get your hands together. Get your hands together. Come on, come on, come with the choir. Get into it, get into it, come on. Aren't you glad to be in the house of the Lord today? I was glad when they said, let us come into the house of the Lord. It's all about the goodness of Jesus. It's all about the goodness of Jesus. And what he's done for me. He's done for me. I just want to praise you. I just want to praise you. For your goodness and mercy, I just want to praise you. 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 I just you been so good to me. So good to me. Hey, I was good. I was glad. 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 I It's all about the goodness of Jesus. And what, what He's done for me. I just want to praise you. I just want to praise you, Lord. I just want to praise you. You've been so good to me. Let's magnify the Lord now. Oh, magnify the Lord. Oh, magnify the Lord. Oh, 
Everybody say, I 
gonna turn it. Turn it around. Turn it around. Yes, he will. Yeah. Listen. God's gonna turn it. Oh Lord, yeah. There's been some doubts in your life, yeah. Oh Lord, yeah. We come to encourage you to see. Oh Lord, yeah. It can't stay this way forever. Oh Lord, yeah, yeah. See, God made me a promise that if ye believe in me, God never would leave me. And if so, won't forsake me. I said, God can't turn it around. I said, God will turn it around. God's gonna change something. Take up all your doubts and your fears. Oh, turn it. Oh, feel the little good right here, yeah. Turn it. Lord, I'm depending on you. Yeah. Hey, somebody be crying, Lord. Yeah. Turn it. We come to encourage you today. Oh, yeah. Just a little bit. The sound of a mustard seed. Oh, God will turn it around. Just like it did for me. we can't say to Jesus today we came to worship him in spite of what some of us may be facing right now in spite of the things that we might be having to go through in spite of losing some things it's only set us up to be blessed to gain more and that is why we can't help but lift our voice today and tell Jesus how much we love him we have to say mm, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm. 
It's not because we've been so faithful. It's not because we've always done good. But you've been there for us to supply our every need. You were there when we felt lonely. You were there in all our pains. You guided our footsteps. Thank you. And you sheltered us from the rain. And it is you who makes our lives complete. Mm. You are to us our everything. This is why we all can see. Jesus, I love you. Yes, we do. Because you care. Oh, 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 Lord. If you weren't there. Come on and help me say. Jesus, I love you. Yes, we do. Because you care. Thank you, Lord. I couldn't imagine what my life would be like if you weren't there. Oh, you are the joy of our salvation. Yes, you are. You're the peace. In the midst of all our storms, yes, sir. Yes, yes, sir. You, are. you are our strong tower Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. and our dearest and best friend. Mm. You're Alpha and Omega, yes, sir. Say that. Say that. the beginning and the end. <laughs> yes, you are our. From Tower, I gotta say it again. Our dearest and best friend. Gotta say it. And it is you yes, Lord. who makes our life so complete. Say it, say it. You are to us everything. I just can't help but say because you care how much I appreciate I imagine you being in my life if you weren't there nobody but you, love you can love a wretch like me because you care not because of all Right, Lord. But you've been there. Show me that you care. I love you, I love you. I love you, Lord. From the depths of my heart, Lord. Yeah. 
to the book of Colossians this morning uh, as we're working our way through the book of Colossians I'm going to deal with the large segment of scripture this morning Colossians chapter 2 I concluded last week with verse 7 today I want to read verse 8 and deal with the following scriptures all the way through verse 23 but I'll only read verse 8 today the book of Colossians, the second chapter, and the eighth verse. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceits, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. And I want to use for a subject today, Stay woke. Stay woke. Stay woke is a slang term that has become a political term here uh, recently. It has to do with staying aware of what's happening, what's transpiring around you. The focus of it from a political uh, standpoint has to do with social justice. Stay woke. Really, of course, we realize that it's bad English, but uh, again, and it is a, a slang term that again just says make sure that you stay alert, make sure that you stay aware. It is based upon the premise that if you are not careful, things can be happening and changing all around you. You're in the midst of it but never really notice what happens. 
It is said that you can boil a frog without a frog ever reacting. If you put the frog in cold water and just slowly turn up the temperature and the frog will never jump out of the kettle because it's not aware because of the increments uh, of change have been so minimal. And certainly the same thing can happen to us as it relates to social justice and other issues in our society. But to, today I want us to look at it in a different context. I want us to think about staying alert, being aware, uh, or, or staying woke. I want us to think about it in, uh, as it relates to our Christian experience, particularly do I want to talk to those of us who are Christians, that the Apostle Paul has already elevated Christ in the earlier section of this book and talked about how grand and great he is, that he is the preeminent one who ought to receive the preeminence from all of us who are believers. He has already expressed unto us how God through Christ is doing what needs to be done for every one of us to experience salvation which in its uh, culmination will allow us to experience glorification or perfection as well. Now as he moves on to this next section or thought he realizes that there are some dangers that every believer faces and all of us who are Christians need to understand that just because you are a Christian does not mean there's not still some dangers that you face. One of the things he really wants to lift up for us as believers is again to understand that people are after your mind. People want you to think incorrectly because if you think incorrectly, you'll live incorrectly. If your thinking is not what it should be, your life certainly cannot be what it needs to be. And so therefore, he is raising that issue up before us today. Every person, every human being has to try to make sense out of life. All of us are doing it. You've done it all of your life. I've uh, sought to do it all of mine uh, as well because every human being is searching for answers. People are aware of that. That's why they're writing books. That's why they have TV shows. That's why people are sitting under the shade tree trying to tell you how you are to live your life because we realize that all of us are looking for answers. There are things that perplex all of us, things that leave us in a state of confusion. There places that we want to go and then we want to know how can we possibly get to those new destinations and so we're always looking for answers but the apostle Paul wants us to understand that the answers are in Christ he points out earlier that Christ is the wisdom of God and Christ in Christ is knowledge as well that God already has a plan for our life that God can give us an understanding or a new world view as to what life is all about I've done this illustration before let me do it again because I think it can be helpful perhaps with uh, this section of scripture that we are dealing with if you would look at my uh, jacket that I have on today if you would look at it when you look at me if you haven't figured out something wrong with this something wrong with you because when you look at this something immediately tells you this is not right something immediately says some changes need to be made the Apostle Paul is saying you can be walking around like this and all kind of people will have all kinds of opinions. There will be some people that will try to convince you that you are right. They will try to convince you that that's the way it was supposed to be. And then some other people just start trying to adjust their body to make it work. It can't work because it's wrong. It can't work because something needs to be done. And so when God looks at humanity, God says you got a problem. God says that there is an issue that needs to be resolved. And the only way you're going to resolve this issue is to deal with your dilemma. Your problem is that you are operating from the wrong origin, the wrong source. You started off wrong. Your problem began at the very beginning. You took button hole number two and put button number one through it. And so if you're going to get it straight, what you have to do is you have to go back and get it like it needed to be in the first place. So you put button number one and button number two. And even though I'm not a model, it looks better than it did. Because all of a sudden you see things begin to line up. That's what the Apostle Paul wanted the uh, Colossian believers to understand. That listen, God has already given clear direction. God has uh, provided his answer to your life dilemma. And he has done it in the person of Jesus Christ. So in verse number 8 he comes back and says unto them, beware, be alert. Be on guard. Understanding, understand that there is some danger that is confronting you. Understand that there are some things that you need to be greatly concerned about. And he lists three major things. The first one he lists is, be aware lest any man spoil you 
uh, through philosophy and vain deceit. He is saying that people can lead you astray in your thinking. Philosophy has to do uh, with human thinking. It has to do with human reasoning. And so we have a lot of different voices that are trying to speak to us and give us guidance and direction. And as we are searching for guidance and direction, we are open to hear all of these different voices. So he says, be careful about who you listen to because there are those who are saying the exact opposite of what God has to say. Now, if you will look at life and then look at the Bible and then look at the Bible and look back at life, you will find out that whatever God says, the world always says something opposite. Whatever God is directing you to do, there are always going to be a lot of voices telling you that that's not the thing to do. You're going to find out that there are always those who are competing with God to be God in your life. Those who always want to take the place of Christ in your life. And so he says, be very, very careful uh, about that because they will bring up the traditions of men. They will come up with what men have to say and how men uh, think and they will try to control you with that. Now here's a question that every one of us needs to ask ourselves on a regular basis. Whose word is directing your life? Who is it that you listen to most? Who is it that you have considered to be enough of an expert where they can tell you how to live your life? Who is it that you are looking to for your worldview? When you're trying to figure out this world in which we live and what's taking place in your life, how do you figure it out? Who helps you with that? What philosophy are you operating upon? Now, even as we look at things like having just come through the terrible uh, flooding that has taken place in this region, we have to try to figure out all of that kind of thing. How did that happen? What is is happening? How should we respond uh, to it? Well, when you have a Christian worldview, you understand, first of all, that this world in which we live is a world that has been effect affected by sin. We live in an environment where things are going to go wrong. We live in an environment where we no longer have perfection. None of us have ever lived in a perfect environment because it fell apart when Adam and Eve were here. So we live in a world where things are going wrong. We live in a world where we're going to have trouble. We live in a world where there's never going to be a long, long long period of time in your life where there's not some kind of trouble. Well, if there's not going to ever be a time when there's not going to be some kind of trouble, I need to have me a theology for trouble. I need to have some way of understanding trouble, some way of relating to trouble, some way of deciding how I'm going to interpret what happens in my life. So when I read the word of God and when I get the wisdom of Christ, Christ says, listen, yes, trouble is going to come in your life. It has nothing to do necessarily with the fact that you are a Christian. Even though you are a Christian, you may be doing the right thing much of the time, trouble can still come in your life. Now, James will say some things unto us uh, in the book of James that really, is really kind of difficult to understand. James says, count it all joy. Now that seems strange. The world doesn't say that. The world doesn't say count it all joy. But James says, no, count it all joy when you fall in the various times of testing and trials, when you have things go wrong in your life. He says, count it all joy when you fall in, because those are some times when God can grow you. That God can take bad things that happen to good people and out of that situation, God can still make you better. God can make you stronger. The growth spurts in your life as it relates to your spiritual life, the growth spurts in your life generally don't come through times of ease. They come through times of difficulty. When you look and listen to some of the songs that you like to hear, uh, Christian songs, many of those songs have been born uh, out of experiences and people have written about them when they've had trouble in their lives. Some of the sayings that you may have heard four parents say in years gone by, once again, it came out of things that they went through when they make, say things like the Lord will make a way somehow. That came out of a trouble experience, but what you saw them evidencing was, since he took me through that, I believe he can take me to this. So they understood that they grew. In Psalm 119 and 71, David says, it was good God afflicted me. Because then I really learned his words that, that I have to understand that God has spoken to some issues and I have to try to grapple with life by understanding what has God said. If I do not, then there will be so many other voices that will say things to me that are contrary to the teaching of the word of God. He, so he says, so that's the problem. I want you to be careful about that. But then he goes back always to Christ in verse number 10 and points out that, listen, you are complete in Christ. Everything you need for salvation is found in Jesus Christ. You don't need Jesus plus anything to be saved. He is God's complete solution to your problem as it relates to being in need of salvation. And so he deals with different things about it, but also he, he brings up the subject of baptism in verse number 12, where he talks about we are buried with him in baptism. When you see people getting baptized, uh, you will see that they are taken under the water. That is symbolic of a burial, and that burial is of the old life. 
the old way of thinking, the old way of living, the old way of reasoning and rationalizing, all of that has been buried. And then when the person comes up, it is symbolic of coming up in the newness of life. That's a crucial point because he's saying you were buried, you died to one way of life, you died to one kingdom, you died to one system of management. Now when you're raised back up, you're in a new kingdom, you're under new uh, management because of the fact that you are a believer. And in Christ, God has done all of that for you. And even the sins that we have committed, we do not once again get away with our sins. But he says, Christ in essence took, uh, or God took the sins uh, uh, of all of us who have accepted Christ, and he nailed them to the cross. Now, they are bringing up the imagery of uh, during the time uh, when the Romans were in charge and they would execute people through crucifixion, uh, which is how Christ died. But above the person being crucified, they would nail at the top of the cross what the person was being crucified for. They would list the offenses. So he's saying here in Christ, what happens is we have a lot of offenses. All of us have sinned. But what God has done in essence is nailed all of those sins and offenses on the cross and then Christ died for them. So then we do not die for our own sins and we are not saved because we don't have sins. We are saved because Jesus paid for our sins. And that is our hope for salvation, not our efforts, not our good works. We are saved not by what we have done or have not done. We are saved by what Christ has done on our behalf. It is crucial and important that we understand our salvation in those regards. But not only that, he says, our enemies who were principalities and powers uh, in verse number 15, those basically have to do with the supernatural beings in the spirit realm, that they have been defeated by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and that he has led them in a parade where they would defeat people during uh, the Roman period, and then they would lead their captives in a line so everybody could see that they have been defeated. So Jesus says, we have forces that are against us, but they've been defeated. He has taken away from them their power to ultimately overcome us because that power uh, has been defeated by Christ who now makes available to power to us to live in a new realm and in a new way. Then in verse number 16, he also comes now and says, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or respect of any holy day or new moon or the Sabbath days. Here was the other thing that was happening. People were trying to say, yes, you've been saved by Christ or yes, you have Christ, but now they had all of these other things you had to do. They had all of these ways you had to eat and things you had to uh, drink and they had different kind of days that you had to observe. All of that is a part of your salvation experience. All of that is a part of trying to get closer to God. He said you don't need to do all of that because you already have access to God now through Christ Jesus our Lord. But also he says the things that in verse number 17 he's explaining the difference um, that Christ makes. He says all of these things are shadows of things to come. So when you're reading the Old Testament and you see that they brought lambs and bulls and dove and had all of those things sacrificed, why don't we do that now? I mean, where are your lamb today? I mean, how, how are you just showing up without some kind of sacrifice? Why are you not kind of bloody today? Why is this place stinking? Why don't we smell the smoke? Why isn't there incense burning? How all of a sudden you just going to come up in God's presence? In the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle, you couldn't just come up in God's presence. They would have been, whoa, ho, where you going? You can't go in the Holy of Holies. Only one person goes there, and he only goes once a year. And he's the high priest. And if he goes in and God doesn't accept his sacrifice, God will kill him while he's in there. You just can't come before the throne of God. So why can we come now? The reason we can come now is because all of that was a shadow of Christ. It showed how difficult it is to approach a holy God. It shows the impact that sin has on the relationship or the uh, possibility of fellowship with God. What is that barrier that stays between us and God? Who can do something about it? So in the Old Testament, they would kill the lamb saying, the lamb is dying for my sin. I did wrong, so here's an innocent lamb that's going to die for me. But when Christ came, that's why John in St. John 1.29, when he saw Christ, he says, Behold the Lamb of God. So the reason you don't have your lamb and I don't have my lamb is because the lamb has already come and died on Calvary's cross and paid for our sin. 
So since Christ has died, he said, don't let people lead you back into things that God has already led you out of. Understand that that has already been fulfilled in the work of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Because if you do not understand that, people will lead you into all kinds of things that there's no reason uh, for you to do. Because again, all of that has been fulfilled in Christ. And so people can try to get you to worship angels and have all kinds of other things that you do that are not necessary to do. And people can end up getting puffed up because of all the extra things that they do. Or even if you went to a monastery and you by yourself all the time and you're giving up this and you don't eat this and you don't eat that. Now you might not eat pork for a number of reasons, but you, you can be a Christian and still eat it. For your salvation, you don't have to be saying, well, you know, I accepted Christ and don't eat pork. No, once you, once you accept Christ, you can eat whatever, whatever is uh, humanly feasible to eat. Because none of those dietary laws really affect your salvation. And so people sometimes do things, and those things lift them up in pride. People become so proud of the sacrifices that they have made, not understanding that Christ made the sacrifice as it relates to salvation. You and I don't have a sacrifice we made, not for salvation. We can sacrifice for the cause of the kingdom of God and out of love for Christ. But there were people who were trying to lead them astray, and I assure you there are people who are trying to lead you astray as well. If that, therefore, that be the case, one of the things that we as believers ought to be uh, greatly intent on doing is studying the word of God. I need to know what God says so I can know the mind of Christ. I need to have the wisdom of Christ. I need to have the knowledge that Christ provides for me so that I can live in a way that is pleasing unto him. I need to know that I don't need to worship angels because when you read the word, whenever you see angels and people try to worship them, angels always tell them, oh, no, 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 don't, don't worship us. We work for him on your behalf. Angels never let us in. And so people will come with all kinds of things and pull people away. There are so many different cults and occults uh, going on today. There are so many things that people are just coming up with and teaching people and when you don't know then people will have you in all kinds of things that was the fear that he had for them be well be careful stay woke because not only are there some political dangers but there are some spiritual dangers as well so make sure that you are aware of what's going on with you and then he says everything that we have in verse number 19 comes from holding the head which is Christ Jesus and then the, the body of joints and, and ligaments all of the nourishment comes to the rest of us but it comes from us uh, from God to us through Christ Jesus our Lord so then the body of Christ is fed through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and that's why we want to be in uh, close communion with him so we can receive all that God has for us now it also says in verse number 20, this third and final problem that I want to lift up. Wherefore, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of this world, why as though living in the world are you subject to ordinances? He goes a little bit farther. There are people who try to put all kinds of rules and restrictions on you that are over and beyond what the word teaches. Now, you know, we lift up things. There are certain things we tell people that they cannot uh, do. And sometimes we can be quite harsh with them, uh, with the church. Like we would tell people, you can't drink. Stop that drinking. I'm not saying alcoholic beverages drinking. Now, the Bible really doesn't say you can't drink. I know somebody say, see, see. I'm saying, no, it really, really doesn't. The Bible really, really doesn't say. Now, the Bible does say in Proverbs that strong drink is a mocker. Oh, in other words, it was saying strong drink can't make you act a fool. Now, that's, that's a fact. We know that. And then the Bible says, don't be drunk. So we understand that. Now, what can happen sometimes, or if we're not careful though, we can come up with so many additional rules that we start saying the things that the Bible didn't say as though the Bible said it. And so therefore, you have your six-pack of Budweiser that you're going to drink. But now you're heading toward the cashier with it all up under your coat. Because they know you go to church sometime. Or your bottle of wine or whatever. The Bible doesn't say you can't drink your beer. It doesn't say you can't drink. And I'm not encouraging. I know some parents may say I don't want my children to uh, think in those terms. But the Bible doesn't say you can't do that. Some of you all like to go swing out and you know people say, yeah, all that dancing. The Bible doesn't really say you can't swing out. A lot of things is what's associated with some of the things. You know, it may not be so much 
whether you're swinging out, but who you're swinging out with. You know, I'm just saying that's... But, but to try to avoid the extreme, then we start adding on so many things. And so he's saying that people will come in and just put so many restrictions on everything that you do that you lose sight of what the Lord uh, has said. And so then we start watching people for things. I was remarking earlier today, one time years ago, I was in a grocery store and I, I like the, you know, Denise and I like the little sparkling grape juice and, you know, apple juice and that kind of stuff. So I had a couple of bottles. Uh, I had a couple of bottles of it in my basket and somebody saw me from a long way off in the grocery store and I could tell they were working their way over to that basket. I, I do. They were, they, they want to see. They want to see what the pastor had and what you got in the basket. I can see the look on their face. What's in the basket? So I just turned it over so they could see Welch's is in the basket. But if it had been something else, that would have been all right. Nothing says that I could not do that. I choose not to. And you might choose not to because you feel that it impacts somebody in a negative way. But the Apostle Paul was saying, but be careful about people who just come up with a long list of things that you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do uh, this and that. So he's saying uh, all of those things are not tied into your salvation. Touch not, taste not, uh, handle not. He said all of that stuff is going to perish and these bodies that we're putting it in are going to perish as well. What you want to find out is where did the source of this information come from? Who said that? Did you say it or God said it? If God said it, then I need to hear that because I need to try to stay in line and in touch with what God has told me to do. If men are simply saying it, then I can make that decision on my, uh, on my own. So therefore, the Apostle Paul says, so be careful because there will be people who are always trying uh, to lead you um, astray and people who are doing all kind of weird and strange things to the body and going through all kind of rituals and routines and thinking that that makes them more spiritual and thinking that as a result of that, they are not going to be tempted. But he's saying, in the end, that won't stop you from being tempted. In the end, you're going to still be tempted just as if you didn't do all of those extra rituals and routines that God did not call for. He's saying the focus needs to be Jesus Christ. The focus needs to be, I want to hear what Christ has to say, and I want to seek to live in accordance with the teaching of Christ. I want to give God first place in my life. I want to do those things that are pleasing unto him. I want to live for his honor and for his glory, but I understand that there are all kinds of people who have all kinds of philosophers who want to lead me in all different kinds of directions. I want to get direction from God, and I want God to lead me. And when we do that, we will find that God will give us direction, because notice at the very beginning after God made man after he made him the first thing God started doing was mentoring mankind God says now here's the trees of the garden you can eat of all these trees except that one tree don't eat of that one tree if you eat of that one tree you're surely going to die God gave them all kind of directions and instructions and God says so this is what I want you to do you will find out that whatever God says somebody else is always saying something different Somebody else is always holding something up, trying to have it in competition with the teaching and the word of God. And so Adam and Eve found themselves in the same predicament. Eve had to make a decision because now, hold, hold on, I hear somebody. That's what Eve was. So she heard another voice. There's another voice in the garden. They've been talking to God. The Bible says God would walk with them and talk with them in the cool of the garden, in, uh, in the garden, in the cool of the day. But now there's another voice. And so she starts listening to this other voice. You got to be careful who you listen to. She starts listening to another voice. And this other voice challenges the statement of God. This other voice wanted to know, so what, what did God tell you? And Eve hadn't been listening as closely as she should have, but she was in the ballpark. He said, don't touch the tree. He didn't say don't touch it. He said, don't eat of it. But I guess her reasoning was, once again, if I don't touch it, I can't eat it. But she still went further than what God said. But, that was, but the, devil, the devil told her this. God lying to you. Don't believe, don't believe God. You can't trust God. God messing your life up. God gave him the garden. He gave him everything they needed. They were in a perfect state. They were in utopia. They were high. They had everything people looking for when they get high. I mean, they had the life. And then the devil shows up and say, God lying to you. God holding out on you. God's trying to hurt you. And so Eve had to make up her mind. Should I trust God? Or should I trust the other voice? You and I face that every day. Every day you are facing it. Should I trust God? Because the truth of the matter is, sometimes God says some things that seem strange. Sometimes God looks like he's kind of mm, far out there. So I got to determine, 
Should I trust God? Or should I trust the other voices? So Eve started listening to the other voice. And she said, you know what? The tree does look, it looked like it would be good for food. I don't see nothing wrong with that tree. All these other trees, I don't see why we can't eat of that tree. And so Eve started saying, hmm. So Eve decided to eat of the tree. Because Eve said, I want it. Sometimes whatever God says he doesn't want you to have, sometimes can make you want it more. That's what the scripture, once a Paul points out that, that that's part of what sin is. Sin sometimes won't, whatever God says, you, he doesn't want you to have. So Eve, Eve ate of the uh, forbidden tree. And then after she ate of the forbidden tree, Adam was standing right there. Now Adam was supposed to be taking the leadership role. So everything was already inverted. Instead of Adam taking the leadership role, Adam just stood in the background. And so after she ate, and Adam was standing right there with her. Then Adam was like, Eve, we got to go to God and ask for forgiveness. Eve, you should not have done that. You know we can eat of that. Adam didn't say nothing. The Bible basically said Adam was there, but he was silent. No male participation, just kind of sitting back. Whatever you say, girl. And so he, Eve ate, and then she gave it to Adam, and the Bible said he ate too. And so now here's Adam and Eve both eating of the forbidden tree. Have you ever gotten what you thought you wanted? And when you got it, you found out you didn't really want it? Have you ever thought God was right and the other voice, God was wrong and the other voice was right? And then when you acted on the other voice, you were reminded that God is right? That's what Adam and Eve were, but then there were some negative consequences that came out of listening to the other voice because they had violated what God had to say. But every one of us has to ask ourselves, what do I believe about God and his word? Do I believe that God can be trusted? Or must I look elsewhere and listen to people who are contrary in their teaching to the word of God? Again, when you look at the teaching of the Bible and you look at the world, it's going to always be different. Whatever God says about human masculinity, the world is going to tell you something different. The world is going to try to get you to base your masculinity simply on your physicality or on some other things that you can do. And then the word of God is going to say something completely different. The same thing with your femininity. What does it mean to be a woman? The Bible is going to say one thing. The world is going to say something else. You're going to have to decide who you think you can trust family life and, and what God's plan is for men and women. The Bible is going to say one thing, society is going to say something, and there's going to always be pressure put upon you to side with the other voices. But the Apostle Paul says, no, you are to side with God. Because when we go to God and God gives us answers, God will be so different from what the world is saying. One of the issues that we often deal with as uh, human beings is what has been referred to as low self-esteem. Low self-esteem. Where, where, where would you get that from? Low self-esteem basically comes from other people's impression of you that's been expressed to you. And then out of, the, out of that, some, some of that can grow from yourself, believing what other people uh, say about you and then what you believe about yourself. But where do you get the information from? She's cute. Who defines cute? I mean, who came up with the cute standard? She's ugly. Who came up with the ugly standard? Who's empowered to name cute and ugly. But if you give somebody that kind of power, they said you're ugly. Soon they tell you, oh, you drop your head. Went to the back of the room, tried to hide in the corner in the dark because they told you you were ugly. And you accepted that. And you wore that label. They told you you were inadequate. You were not good enough. And so you accepted that because somebody's word was directed toward you. And now your life is, is lived as an inferior person because of what somebody said to you. And then you go back to God. All right. Say, Lord, they told me I was ugly. They told me I was less than. And all the other negative things they said. Lord, what do you say? And if you read enough of his word, you read enough of his word and listen to what he says, God will say, let me tell you something. And you can go tell them what I told you. Let me tell you something. You, with your thick lips and your wide nose, you, with your big head and your bulging eyes, you, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. 
You are a work of art. I made you look just like I wanted. Don't try to make your lips thin. Don't try to narrow out your nose. I made you look like you need to look. Don't you let anybody judge you. If they say you ugly, they talk about me. I made you. I made you to look like what I wanted you to look like. You need to raise your head up, walk back in that room, and act like you know who you are. Act like you know who made you. Act like you understand nobody has a right to come in on the art of God in that way. And so if folk look at you and don't appreciate you, you tell them they don't know good art when they see it. Because you have a divine designer who made you. You need to feel good about you because you know who you are. Because you've been listening to what God said about you and not what somebody else said about you. That you have power. You have capabilities. You have things that you can do. God created you to do great things. The word of God will teach us what God wants us to know about himself. And he gives us that through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul says, so therefore, beware. Stay woke. Make sure that you don't let other influences come in and override the influence of God in your life. And that's why the songwriter said, my hope... My earnest expectation, my life and lifestyle is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. My hope for salvation, my hope for eternity is built on nothing that is less than the blood and righteousness of Jesus Christ. I'm not trusting in myself. I'm not trusting in men. I'm not trusting in good works. I am trusting in Jesus Christ. My hope is built. On Jesus Christ. That's what he wanted them to focus on. Make sure your hope is built on Jesus Christ. And then he says, the songwriter says in one of the other verses, on Christ, the solid rock, I stand. If you're a believer, you got a good place to stand because you ought to just stand on Christ. The Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar. If anybody disagrees with God, they are lying and not God. God is always right in everything that God says. And we ought to stand on what God has said. We ought to stand on Jesus Christ. He says, on Christ, the solid rock, I stand all of the ground. He says it's sinking sand. All of the ground is quicksand. Why would you get in quicksand when you got a solid place to stand? Why would you be listening to what everybody else has to say when you have the word of God? Why would you base your life on the philosophies of men when you have the word of God to base your life on? I will stand on a solid rock, and that solid place I have to stand is Jesus Christ. Everything else is quicksand, and I refuse to base my life on that because I've lived long enough too to know that there have been so many times when I thought I was right, only to find out I was wrong. But I've never found God to be wrong about anything. Whatever God says, in the end, you find out God is always the one that is true. And so therefore, as believers, the Apostle Paul says, stay woke and make sure you don't let anybody lead you astray. Make sure you don't let anybody create for you a new type of religion. That is not based upon what the word of God teaches you about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If you believe God knows what he's talking about, then you ought to busy yourself finding out what God has said. And once God has spoken, that's what we ought to base our life on. I challenge you to give that some serious thought and to make up your mind today that I'm not listening to what everybody else has to say when they are contradicting what God has to say. We all appreciate education, secular education, and what it has to offer. But whenever there's a conflict between what God says and what others say, the church ought to always say, we're standing with God. I am not a glorified monkey. Evolution is not what explains my being. I'm here because in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and God created mankind and placed them on the earth. My story is not about some accident. My story is about the intelligence of the most intelligent being that there is, the eternal one, God, has all of this worked out. My worldview is that I live in a world that is full of trouble, and I understand that it is full of trouble because of sin. The 8th chapter of Romans explains that God knows that, that when Adam and Eve sinned, all of creation got messed up too. It wasn't just that sin hurt Adam and Eve. The whole universe got messed up. And in 8th chapter of Romans, God says that in the end, God's going to bring it all back together. But it hasn't happened yet. 
This won't be the last hurricane. This won't be the last flood. Other things are going to happen. We understand that that's the environment that we live in. But one of these days, when this life is over, we will go to a perfect place. One of these days, we will get a perfect body. But in the meantime, we have to deal with what we have to deal with. But we find out God knows how to keep you. And God knows how to keep giving you the energy to get up and keep on moving forward. When we understand that even in a troubled world, we still have a good God who is able to sustain us and to keep us. And so we live our lives not with the philosophies of men, not like we're confused and lost, but rather we live our lives knowing that we have a God who is going to lead us through everything that we face. And I don't know what happened to you with this hurricane and with the flooding, but whatever happened, the God that you serve is going to see you through it. He is going to see you through it. When trouble comes your way, the God that you serve, he's going to see you through it. I love that song when part of it says, I'm a witness.